Chapter 13, Supply Chain Performance Measurement and Financial Analysis. I'd like to take a fairly complex topic and break it down to a series of steps. But first I want to ask the question, what is the difference between a measure and a metric? Traditionally, the term measure was used to denote any quantitative output of an activity or process. Today, the term metric is being used more often in place of the term measure. What are the characteristics of good metric? Well, the first question to be asked about a metric is, is it quantitative? While not all metrics are quantitative, this is usually a requirement when measuring the outputs of processes or functions. The second question to be asked about a metric is, is it easy to understand? Third is, does it encourage appropriate behavior? A basic principle of management is that metrics will drive behavior. And while the Wells Fargo issue doesn't address supply chain per se, I think it provides a pretty startling example of how metrics can drive very bad behavior. So we need to think about these things rather explicitly. The fourth question to be asked is, is the metric visible? Good metrics should be readily available to those who use them. Okay, the question of is it easy to understand and the question of is it defined and mutually understood are quite directly related. The sixth question to be asked is does the metric encompass both outputs and inputs? Process metrics such as on-time delivery need to incorporate causes and effects into their calculation and evaluation. And then the seventh question to be asked is does it measure only what is important? The supply chain operation generates huge volumes of transactional data on a daily basis. The eighth question to be asked about a good metric is, is it multidimensional? Although a single metric will not be multidimensional, a firm's metric program will be. And the ninth question to be asked is, does the process use economies of effort? Another way to ask this question is, do we get more benefits from the metric than we incur costs to generate it? The last question to be asked about a good metric is probably the most important. Does it facilitate trust? If it does not, complying with the other nine characteristics makes little or no difference for the effectiveness of the metric. Okay, so let's look at um, raising the performance bar through the use of metrics. First, the development of a metrics program should be the result of a team effort. Successful metrics implementations involve development teams comprised of individuals representing functional areas within the firm that will be impacted by the metrics. Because this phase of development requires metric identification and definition, it's critical that all impacted areas agree on the appropriate metrics and their definitions. This agreement will lead to a more successful implementation and use of the metrics to manage the business. Second, involve customers and suppliers where appropriate in the metrics development process. Because customers feel the impact of metrics and suppliers are actively involved in the execution of the metrics, their involvement is also critical to successful implementation. Another perspective on transaction cost and revenue focuses on how a seller's cost influences a customer's profit and on how a seller's service impacts a customer's revenue. If the cost of a seller's logistic service allows a customer to make more profit from the seller's products, the customer should be willing to buy more products from the seller. <clears throat> Third, develop a tiered structure for the metrics. Fourth, identify metric owners and tie metric goal achievement to an individual's or division's performance evaluation. That provides the motivation to achieve metric goals and to use metrics to manage their business. Fifth, establish a procedure to mitigate conflicts arising from metric development and implementation. Sixth, the supply chain metrics must be consistent with corporate strategy. And finally, establish top management support for the development of a supply chain metrics program. All right, let's look at some performance categories. Time has traditionally been given attention as an important indicator of logistics performance, especially with regard to measuring effectiveness. There are five widely used metrics for time, on-time delivery or receipt, order cycle time, order cycle time variability, response time, and forecasting slash planning cycle time. The metrics capture two elements of time, the elapsed time for the activity and the reliability or variability for the activity. Order cycle time is another very important logistics service metric. Order cycle time influences product availability, customer inventories, and seller's cash flow and profit. 
Quality is another category of metrics, and several dimensions in the quality category are important to logistics and supply chain management. Cost is the measurement for efficiency. Most organizations focus on cost since it's critical to their ability to compete in the market and make adequate profit and returns on assets and or investments. A number of cost metrics related to logistics and supply chain management are important to organizations. Performance metrics for logistics and supply chain management should include logistics operations costs, logistics service metrics, transaction costs and revenue quantification, and channel satisfaction metrics. All right, so let's look at uh, process measure categories. <clears throat> Uh, another metric classification scheme that's been receiving increased attention is that developed by the Supply Chain Council and contained in the Supply Chain Operations and Reference or SCORE model. The five major, major categories of metrics that need to be used to measure the performance of um, the process are reliability, responsiveness, flexibility, cost, and assets. A perspective on transaction costs and revenue focuses on how a seller's cost influences a customer's profit and on how a seller's service impacts a customer's revenue. If the cost of a seller's logistics service allows a customer to make more profit from the seller's product, the customer should be willing to buy more products from the seller. All right, let's look at the supply chain finance connection. Management must view the supply chain alternatives as to their ability to optimize the corporate goal of profit maximization. Some alternatives might minimize costs, but reduce revenue and possibly profits. By implementing supply chain alternatives that optimize profits, the decision maker is taking the systems approach and trading off revenue and costs for optimum profits. Efficiency of the supply chain impacts the time required to process a customer's order. Order processing time has a direct bearing on an organization's order to cash cycle. Typically, the invoice is sent to the customer after the order is shipped. The longer the order to cash cycle, the longer it takes for the seller to get its payment. The longer the order to cash cycle, the higher the accounts receivable and the higher the investment in sold, finished goods. So the length of the order to cash cycle directly relates to the amount of capital tied up and not available for other investments. <clears throat> While process efficiency and cost savings are worthy goals, top management generally prefers um, to incorporate improvements in terms of increases in revenue and profits. The apparent conflict between the goals of top management and supply chain management can be readily resolved by converting cost savings into equivalent revenue increases. And you can see the appropriate um, revenue uh, equation on the slide. And the absolute size of the profit must be considered in relation to the stockholder's net investment or net worth. An organization's financial performance is also judged by the profit it generates in relationship to the assets utilized or return on assets, ROA. The supply chain plays a critical role in determining the level of profitability in an organization. The level of inventory owned by an organization in its supply chain determines the assets or capital devoted to inventory. The order to cash cycle, as we've said, affects the time required to receive payment from a sale, thereby impacting the accounts receivable and cash assets. Channel structure management includes decisions regarding the use of outsourcing, channel inventories, information systems, and channel structure. By outsourcing supply chain activities, the organization might realize lower supply chain costs and increase revenues from improved supply chain service. Decisions that lower supply chain assets and or improve revenue through supply chain impro service improvements result in a higher return on assets, or ROA. <coughs> inventory management decisions that reduce inventory, such as safety stock, obsolete and or excess stock, and optimize inventory location, relationship to sales or use patterns, reduce the investment in inventory. Effective order management not only reduces supply chain costs, but also supports increased revenue. The combined effect resulting in a higher ROA, or return on assets. Finally, reducing transportation transit time and the variability of transit time will have a positive impact on revenues, as well as on inventory levels. 
Okay, so let's briefly consider financial implications of supply chain strategies. Um, we mentioned channel structure previously. Channel structure management includes decisions regarding the use of outsourcing, channel inventories, information systems, and channel structure. By outsourcing supply chain activities, the organization might realize lower supply chain costs, a reduction in assets, and increased revenue. Decisions that lower supply chain asset and or improve revenue through supply chain service improvements, as we said, result in a higher ROA, a return on assets. And just a little bit more support on the idea of um, effective order management, which not only reduces supply chain costs, but also supports increased revenue. And as we said, the combined effect results in a higher return on assets, or ROA. And then finally, reducing transportation transit time and the variability of transit time will have a positive impact on revenue as well as on inventory levels. So the result of supply chain service failures are added to the cost to correct the problem in lost sales. And this figure shows the methodology for determining the cost of service failures. When supply chain service failures occur, a portion of the customers experiencing the service failure will request that the orders be corrected and the others will refuse the order. The refused orders represent lost sales revenue, refused order times revenue per order, that must be deducted from total sales. For the rectified orders, the customer's right might request an invoice deduction to compensate them for any inconvenience or added costs. 